right. Well, I'm also happy that uh, Robert invited me to talk at this uh, event. So, so yeah, so my name is uh, Xavier Leroy. I'm uh, now a professor at Collège de France in Paris, and I'm going to uh, uh, talk about a recent trend, or recent, a trend in primary language research of the last 15 years or so, uh, um, concerning the uh, increasing use of uh, theorem provers in uh, PL research. And, uh, and which has, in my opinion, changed uh, the way we do uh, research in programming languages. So, but let, let me start with a more general question, uh, the one of, uh, oh yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Let's see, is that any better? Okay, well. Yeah, if, if, if there are still a problem. All right, so yeah, the problem we would like to start with is that of supporting evidence for new ideas. So you have a new idea in programming languages. What evidence can you provide to support it? And so basically you can do it the Marie Curie way or the uh, Robin Milner way, uh, two of my personal heroes. Um, on the one side, you have experimental evidence that you can provide. For instance, demonstrate actual impact in the software world which is hard because it takes a lot of time to have actual impact in the software world, and measuring that impact is also pretty difficult. Uh, so in general, we do controlled experiments, like case studies or benchmarks. Uh, people who work on optimizing compilers, for instance, will measure the performance of the compiled code on standard benchmarks, and that's experimental evidence. And on the other side, uh, which, which I'm going to talk most about today, is mathematical evidence. So you start by providing a mathematically precise description of your idea, and then you try to prove, in the sense of mathematical proof, some expected properties, like soundness. Uh, basically, it does no harm, or if it does something, it is uh, a, a good result. Completeness, does it always uh, find uh, a solution, for instance? Is the solution optimal in some sense? Complexity of the underlying computational problems or underlying algorithms, etc. And, excuse me, and uh, uh, soundness is particular, uh, especially important to us in, in, in purple circles. Uh, so the quote above is, uh, uh, is uh, Alain Shivers, uh, I'm attributing it to John Reynolds, who was in his uh, PhD committee. So Alain, uh, during his PhD, developed a, a very nice new technique for analyzing uh, functional programs and uh, in particular uh, scheme programs and optimizing them the way we optimize C or Fortran programs. Uh, that's called the uh, uh, control flow analysis. And, uh, uh, but then uh, John Reynolds and maybe other members of his PhD committee told him that, uh, well, he also had to demonstrate uh, some uh, soundness, some, uh, the fact that his optimizations were uh, sound and his analyses were giving uh, uh, correct results. And so the kind of soundness results we want to have is, uh, for instance, to show that the algorithm produces valid results. Uh, the type system will reject programs that go wrong. The static analysis makes predictions that hold for all program executions. The compiler optimization preserves the meanings of programs, don't introduce, don't change the, the meaning, or don't introduce bugs. And sometimes you will see those kind of questions referred to as meta theory of programming languages. So it's an awful uh, uh, term because it's scary. Uh, but it's actually just uh, uh, by, by uh, allusion to logics. Uh, so so in, in formal logics, a theory is a logic. There are set theories, there's type theory. And the meta theory of a logic is proving things about the logic itself. For instance, that the logic cannot derive a contradiction, A and not A. So the logic has no paradoxes, lo the logic is sound. So that's a meta theory. Uh, and when you, you, you're proving those kind of results, uh, there's often a tension between uh, doing mathematics and doing engineering. As computer scientists, we are lucky we can do both. So, um, so on the mathematical side, you want elegant, uncluttered abstractions, as simple as possible to get your ideas across. And if, you want, if you're thinking more in terms of engineering and impact in the real world, you want to move to more practical, uh, more detailed artifacts, but quite often overly detailed. And 
And usually you start on the uh, simple side. So you have an idea, and because it's fresh in your mind, you can develop it with a small formal system. Um, and, and then do some decent proofs of simple properties on it. And it write a paper that looks pretty good, it makes reviewers happy, is published. And then the temptation is to make it more realistic. Okay, so let's add some stuff. Uh, and let, let's make it look more like a real programming language, for instance. And then you will get a much bigger complicated systems. Now you have three syntactic categories with 12 constructs each. And now all of your proofs are either excruciatingly long, like uh, 36 cases uh, uh, to do, uh, or uh, they become fast and loose. Okay, like you show the three interesting cases and you say, okay, the remaining cases are similar. I've done that, don't, don't worry, don't, don't feel bad. <laughs> and then you send that for review, and well, reviewers oh, may give up, say no, it's just too complicated, I can't review. Or they will get to the end of the paper and be completely exhausted. Or they will say, well, the paper is good, but I'm not going to go to review all those proofs, it's just too much. And then what do you do next? Maybe uh, you should turn to machine assistance. Um, so John, John Mitchell uh, told me once that uh, proofs written by computer scientists are boring because they read as if the author is programming the reader. You know, the case analysis, you know, consider this, let that. And, and there's maybe a bit of truth to that. So it's true that well, mathematicians like more elegant proofs because they, they give more value to a nice proof. Uh, for us, computer scientists, proofs are often just a mean of convincing people a mean of providing evidence, not an end. But, well, if, uh, if we, we write uh, uh, proofs like we write programs, maybe the, the, our proofs should be read, at least in part, by computers. Okay? And that's what the theorem proving community has been done uh, for a long time. So uh, uh, they've been working on systems that can infer proofs, but also uh, just uh, uh, check proofs. And, uh, and, and a combination of those uh, might actually help uh, in, in PL research. Um, so there are many, excuse me. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. <laughs> okay, yeah, we, we, we'll take that after. All right, so uh, there are many uses of theorem provers. So yeah, there are basically two kinds of theorem provers. There are the automatic theorem provers, like the uh, SAT and SMT solvers that Lindsay talked about this morning, and some other systems. Um, and, and the important word is automatic, like push button, okay? And, and they, they will say either yes, it's true, or no, it's false, or I don't know. Uh, but they tend to deal with a relatively simple logic, first order uh, logic. And those have been used heavily uh, in program provers, for instance. So, so you start with programs annotated with preconditions, plus conditions, invariants, and your program prover will generate so-called verification conditions that are big uh, uh, logical implications, and that you can run through the automatic theorem provers uh, 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 to prove them. Uh, but also, as, as Lindsay mentioned, it's also been used a lot in static analyzers and related tools as kind of generic solvers. So traditionally, when you do static analysis, you develop a, a, uh, an analysis algorithm that is uh, tailored exactly to the problem you want to solve, to the uh, property you want to infer by static analysis. But in the last uh, 15 years, it's become obvious that for many uh, uh, problems, you just express them as a logical formula, a SAT-solving SAT uh, formula, or SMT, or whatever, and, and run them through a generic solver, and that works almost as well as a, a, a dedicated solver, and it's much easier. So, in particular, at Microsoft Research, they've done a, a series of very impressive uh, very, uh, static anal analyzers uh, that use this approach. But what I'm going to talk most about today is interactive theorem provers, like uh, Kirk, Isabel, Hall, HOL, uh, Lean. Those will give you much richer specification languages, higher order logic, plus functional programming. Uh, but they are not push button at all. Uh, so the user ends up writing big parts of the proof. Okay? But the system will uh, uh, recheck the proofs uh, for consistency, logical consistency, and exhaustiveness. And typical uses in PL world is, uh, well, 
you can formalize a programming language and verify specific programs written in this language. So develop your own verification infrastructure. This is exactly what the uh, 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 people at NICTA in Australia have done to verify the SEL4 uh, microkernel by developing their own verification tools uh, for C and assembly and, uh, within uh, HOL. And then you can also do the meta theory bit, which is to formalize the programming language and prove properties of all programs typically the soundness of a type system or the program logic, the correctness of program transformations, et cetera. So uh, in, in, in the demo I'm going to give, uh, I'll, I'll be using the uh, Kirk proof assistant. So here is a quick overview. Um, first, it gives you a rich specification language called Galena. So they have a bit of an obsession for roosters and hens. Um, so uh, uh, the Galena language that uh, includes basically a syntax for ordinary mathematics. So this is a, a Fermat's uh, last theorem. Uh, as you see, it's some kind of ASCII rendition of mathematics notation. Um, maybe I will read that aloud for you. So for all x, y, z, and n of type nat, if n is uh, greater than or equal to 3, and x is positive, and y is positive, and z is positive, then uh, or x to the n plus y to the n is different from z to the n. OK? Uh, whoops. But you also have uh, uh, functional programming. So you can write recursive functions uh, that proceed by case analysis, by pattern matching over tree-shaped data structures, just like you would do in Haskell or Camel. Um, so this is uh, the length of a list. So fixed point means recursive function. And this computes the length of the list L by with two cases, empty list and uh, non-empty list. And then there are support for uh, inductive predicates, which corresponds pretty much to inference rules in, in logic and in PL theory. So for instance, when we, when we specify type systems, we like to give a rule that says, here is how you can assign a type to an application A applied to B. Okay, uh, it has type tau under hypothesis E, provided you can show those two premise, premises. And in, in Cog, that would become a so-called inductive predicate. So it's a relation between typing environment, term, and type that has one case, one constructor per rule. And this is the rule, the constructor for the application rule, which is just a, an implication that says exactly what I said. And so by combi combining those three styles of specifications, you can actually write a lot of uh, nice uh, uh, programming language theory. And now comes the time to uh, prove things. And for that, it's interactive proof using tactics. So I like to call that the, well, in, in a paper in 2006, I wrote it, uh, I, I called that the video game. And, and not everyone was happy with that because but I like video games. I mean, there's nothing wrong with video games. So let's say it's a text adventure game, okay? So, so, so you see, you see an, uh, the current goal on the screen, and then you can type a command, so-called a tactic, that will either solve the current goal or transform it into sub-goals. For instance, if you ask for an induction over a list, then you will get two sub-goals, one for the nil case, one the, for the cons case. The system gives you some automation, but somewhat limited. For instance, linear arithmetic problems or equational reasoning can be solved automatically. And under the hood, Kirk will build a proof term, a representation of the proof that is actually rechecked at the end. So uh, you get very high confidence that, that the proof is correct. And the demo will be a compiler verification uh, a problem. So Marco already mentioned uh, uh, this uh, line of work, and it's been my main line of work of the last 15 years or so. And the idea is you want to prove that your compiler always generates machine code that implements the semantics of the source program. So you don't want compilation to change the meaning of your program or even to produce a wrong program that's going to crash. That's called miscompilation. And it's, uh, it's a consequence of a bug in the compiler. It's extremely hard to detect. And it's extremely annoying when you're doing high assurance software. So what we are going to do, well, we are going to show a compiler verification for a very simple compiler. So from a source language of arithmetic expressions to a target language, which is a machine language for a very simple stack-based machine. So we'll characterize the languages by abstract syntax and semantics and define a compiler from source abstract syntax to target abstract syntax and show some equivalence between uh, some semantic preservation theorem between the semantics of the source and the compiled code. All right, so 
um, so I'm going to use um, uh, well, there are several interfaces for Cog. So this one is Cog being uh, used under Emacs with so-called proof general uh, system. And I start by importing a bunch of libraries from the Cog standard library. I will need lists, strings, uh, arithmetic over in, uh, integers, and a few others. So we start by defining our source language. Is this big enough for you to read? OK, excellent. Um, so, uh, so it's a simple language of expressions be, uh, built on top of constants and variables and with uh, sums and difference operators. So variables are represented by strings. And expressions is one of those inductive types, kind of a data type in Haskell or, or, or Camel, that says, OK, there are four uh, possible shapes of expressions, a constant carrying an integer n, a variable carrying a variable name v, the sum of two sub-expressions, or the difference of two sub-expressions. And so far, Koch is not doing much. It's just type-checking my definitions and saying, OK. Now we want to give it a semantics to, to expressions. And basically, the, the semantics, the meaning of an expression is its value. Okay? So it, it denotes an integer value, but that value depends on, on the values of variables. So uh, we, we actually have an environment that uh, maps variable names to variable values. And the, the meaning of an expression is actually how it evaluates to which integer, uh, type Z, expression E evaluates in environment N. And this is one of those recursive functions uh, that do case analysis. Okay, uh, So we recurse over E and do case analysis. If E is a constant, then the value is a constant itself. If it's a variable, then the value is whatever the environment says. And if it's a sum, then it will be the sum of the values. And if it's a difference, it will be the difference of the values. Okay, So that's pretty straightforward. And if we run that through Coq, again, it type checks. And it also uh, uh, proves that the function always terminates. Uh, Coq doesn't like functions that, don't, that may not terminate. So it, uh, it always terminates because it recurses on smaller sub-expressions. OK, so now let's move to the target language. So it will be a stack machine in the style of the old Hewlett Packard calculators. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, well, those pocket calculators were instead of uh, typing 1 plus 2 equal, you type 1 push, 1 enter 2 plus, um, so, so called reverse Polish notation. Um, and so we are going to do exactly that. So, so it's a machine with four instructions um, that affect a stack of intermediate results. So one instruction, push const, will push a constant on the stack, push var, will push the value of a variable on the stack, add, will pop two integers, compute their sum, push it back. And up will, like opposite, will pop one integer and push its opposite. And so a, a code, a piece of machine code, is just a list of instructions. And the machine uh, has uh, basically uh, a state of three components. There's a code under execution. There's an environment giving values to, to variables. And there's a stack, which is represented as a list of integers. So the head of the stack, the head of the list is the top of the stack. And now we want to give semantics to the machine. So we'll do that in a slightly different style, just as a relation, step. So step means one step of execution of the machine. So it's a relation between the state after and the state, sorry, the state before and the state after. And, uh, uh, and basically, uh, it's, the step is the effect of executing the first instruction at the beginning of the code sequence. So we have four uh, uh, cases corresponding to the four uh, constructors. And as you see, uh, uh, the four instructions, I'm sorry. And so this is a state before, this is a state after. So the instruction is kind of consumed when, during execution. OK, the code after is the tail of the code before. The environment doesn't change. And now all the action goes on the stack. For instance, push const will add n before the stack. Push var will add n v, which is the value of v before the stack. Step add wants a stack that has at least two elements, n2 and n1, and then it will re replace them by n1 plus n2. And up wants a non-empty stack and replace the top of the stack by, by its opposite. OK? And so this is just a relation that is being defined with four cases. And now we want to do several steps of execution, change the steps. And so now this is these steps with an S uh, relation. That means 0, 1 of several successive steps. So this is a zero case, I'm sorry, the zero case, the one case, and here you can chain 
uh, two sequences, and that gives you the several case. And now at last we can state what it means for the machine to hold safely after executing a, a, a piece of code. Okay, it means that if you start the machine with that piece of code, a given environment, an empty stack, after zero, one or several transitions, you will have executed all of the code, so the code is empty, the environment is unchanged, and at the top of the stack now you have some result, which is the final value. This is the one that would be displayed on the screen of the HP calculator. All right, compilation. Now we want to translate our expressions into code, and we will do that recursively following the structure of the expression, of course. And the idea is that the, code, the piece of code we generate for an expression should evaluate, in, when, when it executes, it should compute the value of the expression and leave it at the top of the stack. And if the expression is a constant, that's trivial. We just generate a push const instruction that will do exactly that. If it's a variable, we generate a push var instruction that does exactly that too. The interesting cases are sum and difference. So now if you have two sub-expressions, E1 and E2, you want to generate code that computes their sum. Well, recursively, you will generate code that computes the value of E1, deposits it at the, leaves it at the top of the stack. Then follow it, this is list concatenation, by the code that, uh, compile code for E2, that will leave the value of E2 at the top of the stack on top of the value of E1, and then you will finish with an add instruction that will combine those two values and give you the value of the, the sum. And for the difference, well, it's almost the same. Our machine doesn't have a subtraction instruction, but we can emulate it by uh, taking the opposite of the second value and then adding, okay? And so those functions, again, it's going to be type checked. And uh, 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 that function is, exe is executable, okay? So you can run it within calc. That's a good way of testing what you're doing. For instance, this is a compiled code for x minus y plus one. So push var, push var, push const, add, well, up, add, why not? And you can even uh, 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 ask code to generate executable code in OCaml or Haskell or Scheme. So I'm not going through all that, but uh, basically uh, you get executable code plus some library code, and you can uh, put some parser and printer around if you want to run it from uh, as a standalone program. But let's go back to proving the correctness of our compiler. So basically this is what we expect. This is the final statement we would like, that for any expression E and environment, variable environment env, if you take the compiled code for E and run it through the machine, then the machine will uh, halt, uh, uh, will not make an error, and at the end uh, you will have the value of E at the top of the stack. Yes, yeah, something I should have mentioned, that the machine can get stuck. Okay, sometimes there are transitions it cannot do. If you try to do an add on an empty stack, for instance, the machine cannot proceed. So, so we really want to show that this is not the case uh, and, uh, and that the final value is a correct one. Ooh, sorry. And well, if we try to do a direct proof of this, it doesn't really work because, uh, for instance, this talks about executions in the empty stack, and pretty soon when you advance through the execution of the generated code, the stack is not empty. So, uh, so we need to strengthen the statement uh, so that we can do an induction over the expression. And so this is the uh, actual statement we want to prove that if you have the machine in this state, there's a compiled code for an expression E followed by any continuation C, some environment, some stack, any stack. Then after a finite number of steps, you've consumed all the code for E, so you're now back to C. The end is unchanged, and at the top of the stack now you have the value of E in end. And that's the thing you can prove by induction uh, uh, on E, so that's what I'm asking for here. And I'm getting four cases when, uh, for the four possible shapes of expressions, constant, variable, sum, and difference. And the base cases are pretty easy. For instance, uh, here, if it's a constant, I'm asked to, to show some steps from this step, this state to that state. And actually a single state, a single step will do it, which is a push const instruction. So that was easy. And request for a variable, it's a single step of push var. And the interesting case is the recursive uh, 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 cases where uh, now we have 
two induction hypotheses that Koch gives us, which corresponds to the statement we want to prove that's already been proved for E1 and E2. And now the trick is uh, uh, to use those statements uh, to, uh, to do our symbolic execution. Ah, damn it. And uh, so I start by uh, simplifying a little the goal. And now I see that I'm, I'm supposed to take some steps from the compiled code for E1 followed by some code. And this is exactly of the shape of the first induction hypothesis. And so I can do transitively a step some steps that will bring me to that state. Now is the code for E1 has been consumed and at the top of the stack, I have the value for E1. And at the beginning of the code, I have the code for E2. So I can try to use the second induction hypothesis. It brings me to this intermediate state. Now I have two uh, uh, values for E1 and E2 and the code is just add followed by C. So now a single transition, add transition will do the job. And for a difference, it's almost the same, only uh, there's a slight uh, mismatch between our uh, code and our computation. So here we are about to add uh, a number on the opposite of another number, and here we have a subtraction. So we have to ask Koch to prove that these are the equal by one of his autom its automatic tactics, and we can conclude. All right. And now the original character statement is just a corollary. You specialize to an empty stack, et cetera, et cetera. And just to finish, I hope I'm not running over time. Um, so you, you may think that this proof is a little long. OK, uh, there's, there's a lot of tactics I had to type. But uh, actually, you can, you can go back to it now that you understand it and uh, try to make it more automatic. And that's fairly easy using some uh, things like EOTO in Coq, which try to apply some lemmas and constructors for you. If I do that, three of the four cases are, dealt, are, are dealt with automatically. Okay. And, uh, uh, and the last case still needs a little bit of arithmetic reasoning. All right. So, um, so that was a quick demo. Now let me go back to the slides. And the first thing I would like to say is that well, that was not a very complicated proof, but it's historically important proof that Marco mentioned in, in, his, uh, uh, in his talk. So we did the complete mechanization of the seminal paper by McCarthy and Painter in, in 1967, uh, which was the first paper to say there is something to be proved about compilers, and let's let us show what, uh, how it works for a very simple language of arithmetic expressions. So, uh, so let me mention a few uh, bigger uh, programming language projects that have been using ITPs in the last years. So there have been formalizations of big languages when, you know, when standards written in English don't suffice, uh, like Jinja, uh, which formalizes a large subset of Java and of the Java virtual machine. Several formalizations of C, like Colera and uh, Formalin by uh, Robert Krebers. Um, uh, the JS cert formalization of JavaScript, the Rust Belt project for Rust. There have been verification of realistic optimizing compilers. So my, my own ComCert project, which is an optimizing compiler for C, is just like the demo, only with 15 languages and, uh, well, 12 languages, uh, 18 passes, and uh, a few tens of thousand lines of code, but it's just like the demo. And KKML, uh, uh, which is a verified compiler for ML, functional language. And then there's also a lot of work uh, recently on advanced program logics that can be specified, proof correct, and even run from within an interactive theorem prover, like the VST uh, logic, which is a separation logic for C, and IRIS, which is a very general framework to define concurrent separation logics. And moving to uh, uh, computer, uh, well, not just programming languages, but more systems uh, 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 projects. There have been major verification projects like uh, the SEL4 microkernel or the Certicos uh, uh, hypervisor. Uh, nice work on file systems, uh, verifying that the file system correctly stores data and is resistant to crashes, FSCQ, build BFS. Distributed applications like Iron Fleet, which is a Paxos style distributed store. Um, uh, great work on security and cryptography as well, such as the uh, METLS uh, verified implementation of the TLS protocol, the secured web uh, protocol, the Evercrypt verified cryptographic library, 
And several large consolidation projects like DeepSpec, uh, which is an NSF expedition with end-to-end -end verification from applications to uh, processor architecture. And uh, HackMS, which is about high assurance cyber physical systems like unmanned helicopters, that kind of things. And as I said at the beginning, I think this is a change in programming language research practices. So about 15 years ago, um, there was this uh, Poppelmark challenge that was published, which was a kind of a collaborative effort to evaluate the usability of uh, uh, proof assistance for PL uh, work. And their vision was a world where every paper on programming languages is accompanied by an electronic appendix with machine-checked proofs. So 15 years later, we are not quite there yet. About 25%, I think, of, uh, of purple papers, which are like that, which is already pretty good. And some benefits of using theorem provers are already apparent. So obviously, we get stronger results that are much more trustworthy and uh, I think more likely to interest uh, uh, people who do uh, high assurance software for aircraft, for uh, uh, network security, uh, cryptographic security, etc. It makes it possible for us to attack bigger, more realistic formalizations because we have machine assistance. It helps with papers, uh, so uh, it makes papers, well, easier to read because you can trust the proofs, so, uh, but also easier to write. So typically, the paper can concentrate on the high level uh, aspects of your ideas and then show the key definitions and lemmas as they appear through uh, the formal development. Uh, and finally, one thing that I believe is important is uh, it gives a second chance to students who are uneasy with proofs. So I've had students who were really insecure in their abilities to uh, do mathematical proof on paper, okay? And we were kind of shy to, 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 ask about, to, to ask for help. And who were very happy to have a theorem prover because the theorem prover, when it says okay, then it's okay. When it says no, then you just try something else. But the theorem prover is infinitely patient. It doesn't judge. It never gets angry. It's, it's absolutely not like our advisor. Right. <laughs> so, uh, and I think that's, that's an important aspect. So there are some limitations and potential risks. Uh, so I'm proving is time consuming, somewhat addictive, like video games. Uh, proof engineering is hard and in its infancy. You think it's hard to engineer software and make it, you know, live uh, uh, through several generations and so on. Well, same thing for mechanized proofs. And then there's a Tower of Babel effect with many systems, few users per system, little reuse from one system to the other. Okay, if you want to learn more, I can only recommend the uh, Software Foundations textbook by uh, Pierce and, and, and co-authors. Uh, so it is a broad introduction to the mathematical and underpinnings of reliable software, but it's uh, uh, also uh, well written as a proof script from the Cog Proof Assistant. So it's really usable for uh, self-study as well. And in closing, I think judicious use of automatic or interactive theorem proving can take your programming language research to new heights. So please go forth and make a nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so we have some time for questions. So anybody in the audience? Hey, thanks for the great talk. Um, it was very interesting to see this life me uh, mechanization of the paper. Um, my question would be on, on proof engineering and uh, whether you could explain a bit more on how, how to do good proof engineering and how to maybe learn good proof engineering and to make, yeah. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure I have that many good advice to give. Um, well, clearly the notion of uh, library is uh, important, so reusable libraries, so components with uh, well-defined interfaces. Um, so for mathematical theories, there is some inspiration to be, got, to be obtained from you know, mathematical traditions, like, like the Bourbaki books or whatever, uh, which tend to be relatively well uh, uh, structured. 
for computer science notions, it's uh, not, not completely obvious. I mean, what is the canonical theory of automata or whatever? So there is still some work in in in, uh, in structuring that into uh, components and libraries with good interfaces, and that can build on top of one another. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is maintainability. So uh, when when you change a bit your definitions or you add new cases, are your proofs resilient or will they all break? My experience is that they are pretty resilient, and uh, the, the system will tell you where they break. So that's already better than on paper, when you don't really know where where where, where it breaks. Uh, then there's uh, there's a program uh, a proof style also that 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 wants to have more automation, so that to be more uh, so as to be more resilient to uh, future changes and evolutions. And um, mm, well, there are also changes evolutions of the theorem prover itself. They are not cast in concrete yet, so so you you also need to freshen your code from time to time to use the new features. Um, well, I, I've, yeah, um, that's some simple things you can do. Uh, okay, another question. Okay, I have a question for you. Um, so what is your experience with people proving the wrong thing on a theorem prover? I mean, it gives a lot of confidence that whenever you have a proof, it's a proof of the theorem, but the theorem may just be wrong. Ha. Well, uh, I can see only two reasons. Uh, so one is that your definitions actually don't mean what you think they do. Um, and the second is there's a bug in the theorem prover. Um, so is that what you were thinking of? question was more like, how often, uh, as a reviewer of popple papers or so, oh. do you see that people actually get the definitions wrong or just a statement of the theorem wrong? Wow, okay. Um, huh. I don't know. I know it happened to me once. Um, so I was transcribing some results from Comcert, and I added parentheses for, so that that would be more legible, and I put them at the wrong place, so my logical formula was false, uh, and a reviewer found it. So, so I felt really stupid. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that happened to me uh, at least once. But yeah, I think that the main, the main risk that remains when you do a mechanized proof is that your definitions are, are, are not quite what, what they should be, okay? And so now the problem of, of trusting a paper uh, bec uh, is no longer trusting the proof, it's trusting the definitions. And the good thing that the definitions are in general much shorter, or so you can hope. So basically you can concentrate on, on agreeing with the definitions of the author or disagreeing, okay, and the statement of the final theorem. But everything in between you can trust very much. So, uh, uh, one more uh, quick question. Maybe by yeah, students. Yeah, go ahead. It's the first. Okay, in that case, uh, by non students. So uh, I apologize in advance for this question. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned the Tower of Babel with uh, sort of communicating within, mm. sort of between different theorem provers, but I find that even within the same theorem prover, this is a problem <laughs> with people creating the same libraries over and over again and maybe not sort of having a standard library that people can actually agree on. Yes, I can. I can relate to that. So, so it's true that probably as as a community we should try harder to build those libraries. And there's also sometimes the uh, oh, well, even within uh, a theorem prover, several authors can have different styles. Okay, that and and that may also there are often several ways to define the same thing in uh, which are somewhat different in the kind of proofs you can do later, and again not always full agreement on the best way to do it. So yes, I agree. We need we need to talk to each other more. Yes. Hey, uh, thank you very much, uh, Xavier, for the talk. Thank and, you. Um,